Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the third Monday of the month, which means it's time for Healing Spices with Dr. Sunil Pai, and we're getting up in the alphabet. We're at the F, so we're going to do fennel seed, fenugreek, Galangal and Galangal, right? Galangal, sorry about that. I never heard of it before. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Sunil Pai. So this is a lot of fun, but you know, there's so many spices. It's amazing. On on month six, we're only on month six. We're only on F. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you for having me back. Uh, Welcome everybody. This is the part six of the Healing Spices series today. Yes, we are going to be talking about fennel seed, fenugreek, Galangal, and garlic. Uh, Again, my name is Dr. Sunil Pai. The websites are down here at the bottom of the screen, sendgemini.net and sendgeministore.com and inflammation nation and bossmeric.com for more information. So today let's get started. Again, just bringing back where a lot of this information I'm going to be uh, talking about in this series is coming from my best-selling book and inflammation nation. For those who are interested in learning about inflammation, please check it out on Amazon or you can order a signed copy from our office, or it's even on audible. If you like to listen to it, uh, when you're driving or working out. Uh, and also most of the information on this series specifically is from this wonderful book that I also recommend everybody to get called healing spices by Dr. Uh, Bharat Agarwal, which I'm basically summarizing it uh, with his consent. Uh, he's a good colleague of mine who we worked in the past. He was a famous researcher at MD Anderson looking at cancer therapeutics and natural agents. Uh, he discovered many, many uh, types of pathways and uh, pharmaceutical agents that are used commonly now in oncology, but his love was looking at the traditional role of indigenous medicines like Ayurvedic medicine in India and traditional Chinese medicine. And this is where we use food as spices. So going forward, you know, we're looking at, you know, food is medicine, but the important thing that I always mentioned that, you know, in the plant-based diet, particularly here in the United States is that it's kind of boring in flavors because we're not really taught about the use of spices. Most of us had just regular kind of, you know, standard American fair diet. Then we remove the animal protein kind of increase the, the greens, the beans, the vegetable grains, the legumes, the seeds, and nuts, but it still kind of lacked a lot of flavor. And so this is where we're looking at how we make food, not only medicine, but actually tastier for you. So today we're going to start off with number 21. So we have 21 uh, er, uh, herbs and spices so far that we've covered. If you have not seen the previous five episodes, please go back and watch them on YouTube. And then at the very end of the series, toward the end of the year, I'm going to actually be talking about certain recipes, certain spice mixes, and then we'll also kind of be putting the um, herbs and spices in kind of condition oriented fashion. So those people will say like, Hey, I have diabetes or I have heart disease or I have menstrual cramp problems, or I have any other kind of issue. Then I'll also pair the herbs and spices in groups. So then you might say, Hey, you know what? I'm going to just cook a lot more with these. So let's start with fennel seeds, fennel seeds, calm cramps and colic. Now, fennel seeds are great. You know, this is how they look. They're, they're, very, they're very sweet tasting. A lot of people think of fennel seeds similar to anise seeds, right? It has that licorice type of taste. It relieves menstrual pain, helps with colic wonderfully, uh, helps with IBS, uh, similar to the anise as well, uh, helps with Alzheimer's, cancer reduction, has anti-inflammatory properties, lowers blood pressure, prevents clots. And even there's been some studies on a topical, which we don't have available here in the United States, but a topical form of fennel seed extract that actually was shown to actually help lower glaucoma pressures. So the benefits of fennel seed, let's start with menstrual pain. You know, this, again, this is fantastic because as you know, uh, most of us, or if you have not known, if read my book and in Inflammation Nation, is that, you know, we're always trying to avoid the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory ibuprofen, which is, you know, Motrin and Advil or, and naproxen, which is Aleve. Those things have black box warnings, which means that you can have a heart attack or stroke or a GI bleed at any time, just taking one of them. And, you know, women having menstrual cramps, you know, NSAIDs, ibuprofen is a common thing that is taken, you know, monthly. Uh, interesting thing is they took the fennel seed extract and they actually showed complete pain relief or pain decrease in about 80% of the women versus 73% with the drug ibuprofen. So fantastically uh, to help, you know, using uh, a little bit more fennel seed during that time of the month, if you have bad menstrual cramps and without any GI symptoms or actually risk of heart attack or stroke or GI bleed. Hirsutism is also important. You know, there was a topical version that was done in the study that was showing to reduce the, the diameter of uh, hair in women that had unwanted you know, facial hair, just like with women who get what they call PCOS, it's kind of a, an excess hormone, they actually get more testosterone production It's something that, you know, they can look into, like maybe looking at a, a topical version of that, uh, kind of thinning out some of the hair. 
Now, for any of the uh, new parents or parents that have many kids, you know, colic is, a, is an issue. Everybody understands it when they have kids age two to 12 weeks were uh, performed in a study giving some fennel seed oil. Uh, and it eliminated 65% of the colic versus 24% in placebo. So three times better. And the daily crying of the infant decreased from three and a half hours to one and a half hours, which is a godsend for most parents and most you know, uh, of young children because it can, you know, it can really cause a lot of stress. So helping the baby feel more calm and then helping also the parents feel more calm that they can get a little bit more sleep uh, in the early months of the baby's life. Alzheimer's disease and dementia disease is interesting enough that it improves memory in the animals uh, in the animal studies by boosting acetylcholine, similar to Donacept, which is Aricept, is one of these you know Alzheimer's drugs. So this is kind of interesting that we could be using food as medicine, and as we use this longer term, starting earlier in our life, then this might be able something to help slow down and maybe even prevent some of these dementia diseases. IBS and Crohn's disease. So when people have really bad colitis, palpable pains, you know, along the large intestine, it disappeared in 96% of the patients by basically 15 days. And also the loose bowel movement that comes with IBD, irritable bowel disease with diarrhea, also normalized. Same thing, you know, if you go back to the previous uh, slides in my previous series, talking about aniseed, there's a very similar benefits of IBS uh, along with that. And then arthritis, it does decrease inflammation and swelling, uh, rheumatoid, osteo, and even low back pain. So again, fennel seed, delicious to use. These are some examples. My favorite is butternut squash, wild rice salad, with cranberries and fennel. One of these wonderful things to take during the summertime right now, roasted potato and fennel soup. You know, soups is one thing that a lot of people love to use that fennel it has that like Swedish licorice taste. Again, spinach, fettuccine uh, and fennel. Uh, we always use it on like pizzas, like, like caramelized onions. And also for those, you know, who are more from Europe, you'll see uh, fennel liquors. So these are some things that can be added as an uh, aperitif or digestive. It is actually derived from the fennel seed, just similar to the anise li liquors that, you know, very similar tasting of that licorice uh, flavor. Now, fennel seed pairs with allspice, bay leaf, black cumin, cardamom, cinnamon, clove, coriander, cumin, fenugreek, galangal, which I'll speak about, garlic, ginger, marjoram, onion, rosemary, sun-dried tomatoes, tamarind, and turmeric. But it also complements very much uh, any kind of vegan cheeses, curries, mushrooms, pasta, again, vegan sausage, vegan chicken, uh, sautés, and tomatoes. It's a wonderful thing because adding that little sweetness, although it's not a sugar, it's not going to increase your um, blood sugar, but a lot of people like to have that little bit of a, a sweetness, a little bit of licorice taste. Now, some people may not like it, but I love to just add a little hint, particularly like in the soups and on pastas is one of my favorite things. Also want to go back real quick on fennel seeds. You'll see that uh, in the beginning, let me go back here, is that uh, I mentioned before uh, mukwas. Uh, when people go to an Indian restaurant before they leave, uh, there's usually like a little dish and people would put these little seeds in their hands. And it has, usually has anise, usually has some uh, other types of seeds. Fennel is one of them. Sometimes they have a little bit of sugar coating and stuff like that. But these are great, great um, uh, mouth fresheners, right? So you can chew on a little bit of fennel seeds uh, with some anise seeds. It gives you that licorice um, uh, tasting breath, but also it helps with any kind of, you know, digestive problems. So that's one thing that you might notice uh, seeing uh, fennel seed. Now, fenugreek. Fenugreek is interesting because this is a very strong thing for blood sugar. A lot of people are not really familiar with fenugreek, although they get exposed to it quite often. Uh, fenugreek seeds are quite hard. So usually we recommend people roasting them. And in the book, um, Healing Spices, and they have a little section on like how to, how to prepare each spice, how to buy each spice, how to store each spice, how long they will keep for uh, fresh or frozen in the fridge, in the refrigerator and, and whatnot. And also roasting, like how do you lightly roast a certain type of uh, herbs and spices to actually get more value of the nutrients out of the uh, ingredients. So fenugreek is very important. It helps with cancer, cataracts, cholesterol, diabetes, gallstones, uh, has some antibacterial, antiviral benefits, uh, blood sugar benefits, kidney stones. It helps with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It helps with weight loss. Again, weight loss. Again, everybody's always looking for weight loss. Uh, high triglycerides, low testosterone. It helps with that. I'll talk about that. And also wonderfully, wonderfully for uh, new moms and breastfeeding. It does help with um, producing uh, more milk production. 
So benefits, let's look at diabetes because that's one of the strongest things, you know, in the research where it's been used for um, Ayurvedic medicine uh, and Asian medicine as well. Uh, lowers, lowers blood sugar 25%. And uh, the hemoglobin A1C, which is your three-month blood sugar average, also lowers, lowers cholesterol, lowers the bad cholesterol, LDL 30%, and even triglycerides 30%. So that's pretty good. On par, you know, probably about 10, 15% better than a statin. There was even a study that was taking the fenugreek and they'd make it into, they grind it into a powder, they'd mix it in, as into a flour, and they would just give it as, you know, making it a bread. Uh, with the fenugreek in there and just giving two slices a day and the diabetics lower their insulin resistance. So there's ways that, again, we can take it directly. And there's other ways now we can start adding more spices to foods to make food as medicine. Now, weight loss, as we talked about before, I talked about Ozempic and all those other things with the uh, chef AJ, when you had your uh, weight loss summit and you know, the, everybody's taking like these drugs to suppress uh, uh, weight loss, which has a lot more side effects than people think. And they did a study with people with the BMI over 30. They took eight grams of the powder. They felt fuller. They had higher satiety levels and they ate about 10% less fewer calories. Another study took 600 milligrams a day, which is not much. And they ate 17% less fat and 12% fewer calories. So this is ways that we can do these things natural by lowering your blood, push, uh, blood sugar, by also lowering satiety and eating less calories without actually taking a drug that's suppressing the signals from your brain to your gut and then causing nausea, et cetera, that you see with some of these um, um, newer weight loss drugs. Cancer support, there's data showing that it slows cancer breast, pancreatic, and prostate cancer cells. It does uh, decrease the deposition of calcium oxalate in the kidney by 27%. So those people who eat a lot of animal protein, they get a lot of kidney stones. Um, those people who eat plants who are eating a lot of raw can also get kidney stones because oxalates come in greens, but they are completely removed when your greens are steamed a little bit or even sauteed. So we did invent fire. I always remind people of that. So if you are tending to have a lot of oxalates, then sometimes and kidney stones, even being plant-based, then just uh, steaming and cooking your greens will do that. But also adding fenugreek, if you already have a, a kidney stone, that will also be something to help prevent further uh, kidney stones and also help with the reduction. Gallstones as well. Gallstones reversed by 64%. You know, 800,000 Americans a year get their gallbladders removed. And it comes with us, so we need it. Uh, afterwards, they end up having problems with not only just digesting their fats, uh, but we now understand that the bile from the gallbladder actually circulates four times in the digestive tract uh, before it's excreted out, and it actually helps kind of keep the microbiome in balance. So those people who have their gallstones, uh, gallbladder removed, they actually have higher rates of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth called SIBO, and they also have a, a higher rate of dysbiosis, just overgrowths of bacteria and mycology funguses like candida, et cetera. So kidney stones and gallstones, fenugreek, fantastic. It just seems to be like the one of the stone crushers or stone removers in the body. Hormone balance is important now. One thing that you'll see and that we actually have an exciting product coming out by the end of the year, uh, it's been uh, standardized. It's also been clinically tested and patented. There's certain parts of actually the fenugreek uh, seeds that actually can be removed. Uh, just like the curcumins, we think of like from turmeric, for example, there's different parts of different plants. And there's one part that actually will help with hormonal balance. And that also increases free and total testosterone in both men and women. Now, everybody's on this, you know, hormonal push recently, there's low T going uh, across the globe just due to a variety of environmental causes. But a lot of people are taking topical uh, steroids, but also they also have side effects. So there's one way in natural Ayurvedic medicine for traditionally uh, Ayurvedic medicine, which they would give actually fenugreek for this issue. And it actually helps increase your body's own production. So your body won't produce more than it needs to. So the nice thing is that it's a really safe and natural balance. And we'll be coming out with a men's health product pretty soon that will have that. And people can take that in three months, check their free and total testosterone, and it'll be up rather than taking a topical testosterone that may affect other issues like blood pressure, cardiovascular risk, you know, um, acne, uh, prostate cancer, et cetera. And more importantly, I want to uh, explain for women who are, are newly uh, breastfeeding their babies, and if they have difficulty or trouble, this is a classic uh, use of fenugreek as well. Again, balancing the hormones, but it helps with producing 
and supporting breast milk production. And there's a lot of stress in, in women now in the hospital and, and all the stuff of, you know, kind of like taking the, the baby off the breast or just not having enough production. And this is something that they can take very safely and naturally that we've been doing for, for centuries. Uh, that helps women. Also, it helps a little bit with the bust line for those so women who want to have a little bit larger size. There is some data that it might do some of that as well. So fenugreek, if you haven't tried it, this is something to look forward to. Now, a lot of times, you know, since it has this, you know, fenugreek can sometimes have this um, taste and sometimes when they roast it and it has a maple syrupy smell. Uh, but a lot of times we use it like in, in as a spice of a group. So like when we make the uh, sog, which is like the spinach with tofu or or, pane, you know, um, or, or pollock, as we call it in, in Indian uh, Indian food, bear, bear, Ethiopian spice. I have that here in the middle here with the, all the different spices here. And, and uh, fenugreek is one of them. Uh, dal makani, which is like a red lentil. Um, and then uh, we have Moroccan lentil stew here. Uh, we also have potato okra curry. We call it bindi curry uh, in, in Indian food. And even tendery spice, when people have that kind of reddish color, they usually put on, unfortunately, animal proteins like chicken and fish and all. But we also do vegetables now. Uh, you can get kebabs and all. But that's one of the ingredients that's, that's in the tendery spice. Fenugreek pairs with a lot of things. Asphatida, which I mentioned before uh, in, the, in the first episode, black cumin, black pepper, chili, clove, coriander, curry leaf, garlic, ginger, mustard seed, onion, star anise, tamarind, and turmeric. If you don't know any of these that I've mentioned so far, uh, from asphatida all the way down to curry leaf, that was covered in the previous episode. So please go back and listen and learn about those. And the fenugreek complements things like in breads, like I mentioned before, you can kind of grind a little bit, put in some flour, uh, make it in chutneys and pickles. It goes deliciously with potatoes and tomatoes and vegetable foods. Now, number 23 is galangal. Okay, now it's interesting because a lot of people probably have eaten galangal, particularly if you're in a big city and you have really, really good Thai food. Okay, um, so better health courtesy of Thailand. So Galangal is actually what we call Thai ginger, and it's different than what we call Chinese ginger or Indian ginger. Most of us, when we go, or even Mexican ginger, like we go to the store, we buy ginger, ginger root. Um, the galangal is slightly different. The skin is a little bit different. The color is different. The texture is different. And the components inside of it is slightly different. Galangal has a little bit um, spicier, a little bit different mouthfeel. It has a kind of a, a higher heat value at the beginning, but it doesn't have that lasting after effect of heat, like say what chili does. So it kind of has a nice, nice spice when you're eating like a tom yum soup or some kind of Thai food soup. Usually it's in soups a lot. They actually will slice it a lot and they kind of throw it and they kind of cook it in with the vegetables uh, and like lemongrass and a wonderful, uh, you know, coconut milk sometimes and just a variety of like basil and, and wonderful herbs as well. But it's, it's one of those things that a lot of people will say, oh, I thought that was ginger, but it's actually not. It's gall and gall. So it's one thing that it's a little bit more fibrous on the outside of the of the of the rhizome as well. It's great for allergies, great for cancer, again, diabetes, osteoarthritis, and ulcers. So diabetes, it lowers the, the glucose levels. They actually did a study comparing it to glycoside, which is a, um, uh, a diabetic medication used overseas. It did just as well. It stimulates the pancreas to secrete insulin. Um, it helps with ulcers. So it actually showed, interesting enough, in the study, it inhibits ulcer formation better than three prescription drugs, Prilosec, which is the purple pill, right? Omeprazole, which is like the number one over-the-counter PPI, proton pump inhibitor. This did better. It did better than Tagamet, which is the second one, which is the old generation that we call H2 blockers, and Zytus, which is another um, uh, ulcer-preventing medication. It does this also by inhibiting H. pylori. H. pylori is the... Um, bacteria that when we have inflammation in your stomach, gastritis, it actually then starts to kind of go into that little ulcer area and, and makes the ulcer not heal very well. And so therefore they have to give antibiotics, right? And there's also natural ones we can give as well that we do uh, that actually can eliminate this. So in patient populations that actually have higher rates of H. pylori, which they do see in, in Asia, they actually have less ulcer formation from the bacteria because they're getting exposure in their daily diet to something that actually inhibits it and actually prevents the ulcer from forming. So it's kind of interesting that like here in the United States, almost it's a large over the counter, almost everybody in the population is taking something for heartburn, reflux, digestion problems. And if you look at all the spices that I talked about in part series, 
part one through five so far, most of these things will be helping like reflux and gastritis and stomach issues. But since we don't use those, then we have these problems. This is where food becomes medicine. Interesting thing then, it does have similar to uh, the gingerols in the ginger, which I'll talk about next uh, show, uh, which is, I have a large discussion on that. Um, the galangal has actually something called galangal acetate, and that is the star component, is the anti-inflammatory compound. Again, less knee pain on standing, on walking, less stiffness. It actually decreases the production of three chemokines. Uh, it boosts three components that are linked to stronger, healthier cartilage, like glycaminoglycans and hyaluron and other components of the knee. So again, when we see sometimes, a lot of times we look at people in Asia and like, wow, you know, these people are in their 70s, 80s, 90s, and they're walking on the street carrying all these things. And like, what about, what, they're not really complaining about arthritic conditions. It's because we're eating foods that have anti-inflammatory components, but also help boost the strength of our own cartilage, right? We eat foods here in the United States that are actually decreasing and causing damage to our cartilage. And these are places where they're constantly getting exposure to things that are keeping us um, healthier aging as we get older. Allergies, it does have it like similar to ginger. It does lower the uh, allergic responses. And that's why we have even the ginger in our Bosmeric product for one of those reasons. Cancer support. So interesting, neuroblastoma, which is a specific type of cancer. It has been shown in the culture to actually kill those uh, type of cancer cells. And also the component acetyl uh, chevicol, as acetate turns off cancer cell genes, limits the growth of breast, skin, lung, and blood cancers, kills breast and lung cancers as well. So I'm just kind of summarizing a bunch of studies. So it slows growth, turns off the cancer genes, and then in separate studies, when they have breast cancer cells and lung cancer cells in the culture, and they add the gall and gall extract, it actually will kill it. So these are things that we have to look at, like, can we take these things for prevention and just eat more of these in your diet? So it also triggers enzymes that actually helps the body get rid of carcinogens. So everybody's looking at, oh, I got to do a cleanse. I got to take a product. I got to do some kind of you know, crazy thing. It's like, no, why don't you just be eating the foods that actually do this naturally, right? So this is what we want to talk about. But this is something that if you do go to a Thai restaurant and you get something like a Tom Yum soup or a Tom Kai uh, Ka Gai soup, uh, it will usually, if it's a really good Haitian restaurant, now, depending on where you live, like in our restaurants, they might use more ginger because it's more readily available. But if you live cl close by where there's actually an Asian market, try to go and actually buy some galangal and make some wonderful soups. And it's by, it, it pairs with a lot of things, right? Allspice, black cumin, cardamom, chili, cinnamon, clove, cori uh, coriander, coconut, fenugreek, garlic, lemongrass, mustard seed, onion, tamarind, and turmeric. And it complements, again, any kind of stir fry because, again, it has that ginger type of taste to it. Uh, lots of curries you can use it and soups and stews. Now, I'm going to talk about garlic, and I'm, at the end of this, I'm going to actually give a little bit of a story. One of the things that led me to go into integrative medicine over 23, 24 years ago, being the first in the first class of uh, fellows at the program of integrative medicine with Andrew Weil, I was, I was honored to be selected uh, as, a, as the youngest uh, physician in the country, actually, to go through that program at that time. Uh, so now we're considered being a little bit of the OGs of integrative medicine is garlic uh, is what brought me into uh, the realm of integrative medicine. And I'll end with the story. So, so stay tuned for that. Strong enough to battle heart disease. So everybody knows garlic. It's one of the most you know, popular uh, uh, things used in uh, foods used daily. Anti-aging helps with hair loss. Um, BPH, which is benign prostatic hyperplasia, like large prostate, helps with blood clots. It kind of has a little bit of a thinning effect of blood, uh, not very strong like, a, like an aspirin, but does have some blood thinning effects. Lots of data on cancer. Cholesterol helps with colds and flus. That's what most people end up taking garlic for when they're sick. Helps with blood sugar, heart disease, high blood pressure, sickle cell anemia. Very interesting, although you know, as not many people have that, but it is something that's very important and actually helps the production of new uh, blood cells for those types of patients. So that's something that's fantastic because it's a very difficult uh, condition to, to live with. Stroke and also helps with thrush. And I'll talk about that anti-fungal uh, aspects of garlic. Now, colds and flus, most people take it, right? When we're sick, you know, classically, you know, even people wearing garlic for infections, uh, but it's important. 
Uh, actually, anytime someone has a cold or a flu, you know, actually just not only just eat a cooking more garlic, but actually cutting a little cloves of garlic and chewing it. It's pretty strong, can be pretty pungent, pretty spicy, but usually you can get rid of a cold or flu very, very easily. Now, you might have a little bit of smell of garlic through you, but it's okay. Some, you're not going to get hurt. There's no side effects, but that's something that if you can use more garlic around times of flus or colds, particularly the fresh garlic, and I'll explain why, the fresh has the antimicrobial properties when it's freshly cut. That's why it's really pungent. It has something called allicin, which I'll talk about, which is one of the stronger um, uh, antimicrobial properties from it. It does lower blood sugar, fasting blood sugar in the studies. It has fantastic, fantastic heart uh, disease benefits, right? It lowers your heart disease by 25%. So, you know, again, those people who eat more garlic have lower blood pressure, lowers your cholesterol, it does have a blood thinning effect. Now, it's funny because they usually tell you before surgery, start up any kind of garlic. Uh, funny thing is like when, if you went to Italy, they're not telling all of Italy to stop eating garlic in, in Italian food. So there's a little bit of like, we always look at things like, oh my God, it's dangerous, it's dangerous. Now, I would still stop it just because we, want, we don't want the anesthesiologist to freak out, but it's not that kind of blood thinner. What happens is that it does help prevent platelet inhibition. Same thing with turmeric, same thing with omega-3, same thing with you know, a lot of green tea and, and you know, ginkgo but they don't thin the blood like a, like a platelet inhibitor. They just have these strong anti-inflammatory benefits, which then prevent the, the platelets from becoming more sticky. So it's through the natural effect, but it's not a thinner as what people are worried about. Like, oh, I take too much garlic, it's gonna thin me. I'm gonna eat too much garlic, it's gonna thin my blood out. It doesn't really do that. It lowers heart attack by 40%. Now, if we have a drug that does like 2%, or even 5% reduction, it would be a blockbuster, $10 billion, $13 billion market share per year. Here, this is lowering heart attacks by 40%. And even when you go back 3,000 years, right, BCE, 3,000 BCE, Charak, which is the father of Ayurvedic medicine, who wrote the kind of the, the textbook of Ayurvedic medicine. We have a, a Charak was the father of the, what we call medicine or internal medicine aspects. And then we have Shushutra, who wrote the surgical text back then as well, which we use a lot of the stuff from surgery today. That's a whole other discussion, but it was written about that garlic strengthens the heart and keeps the blood fluid, right? So they already knew back then. Now we're talking about platelet inhibition and cholesterol, LDL, you know, you know, all these wonderful things, but food is medicine. So this is one of the simplest things. And when we look at cancer, interesting thing is out of all the um, vegetables that are used for, for, and they did studies, I think actually Dr. Grieger has one on his site where they compare, he goes over all the studies looking at, you know, what are the strongest anti-cancer foods? Um, garlic is number one, onions are number two. And then, you know, then we get into some of the greens like later on, like kale and spinach and those kind of things. But garlic is still always the strongest. Lowers colon cancer risk 41%. So again, the people who eat the highest amount of garlic in the studies had the lowest re recurrence uh, of, of, can of cancer in the colon. Now, colon cancer now is number two cause of cancer in the United States in both men and women, right? So 40% reduction. So again, can we reduce someone's heart attack by 40%? Yes, number one cause of death. Can we re reduce the number two cause of, of cancer in America by eating a little bit more garlic? Yes. The problem is most people don't eat enough of this, right? Or they might just use a little bit of like garlic powder on something and they're not actually eating fresh or whole or even enough of it. It does suppress the progression of colon polyps from turning from a regular colon polyp to a cancerous one, which is important. It decreases lung cancer 22%, prostate cancer 36%, and brain tumors, 34%, right? So eat more garlic. People who have these type of conditions or know someone, make sure that if you're bringing them some food, make sure that you're putting a little bit more garlic in there. You know, This is very, very important to have. Again, super safe, super effective, no side effects, right? Um, it lowers the rate of stomach cancer by 47% and endometrial cancer, 38%. So like we're having this like 40% reduction of, you know, cancer, uh, uh, you know, uh, lung 22, brain 34, stomach, endometrial and heart attack. Like everybody should be eating a little bit more garlic. Now, obviously you want to make sure you try to get as much garlic that is organic, right? These things are heavily sprayed. Um, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between aged garlic and fresh garlic. Real important because when you go to the store, you know, a lot of people would hear on the radio for many, many years, and they used to talk about like, 
products, you know, garlic products, you know, aged garlic extracts and stuff like that. And aged garlic extracts have been shown to be helpful for more of the cardiovascular benefits, right? But it's really the fresh garlic that actually has the antimicrobial properties. And I want to just talk a little bit about the story because I think it's really important to understand what drove me to get into integrative medicine and how why I'm so passionate about food and food being medicine is that I did publish one of the first studies in 1995 on the antifungal effects of garlic extract. Now, let me explain the story. So let me start off with some foods first so I can get to that. So example of garlic, garlic noodles, you know, tofu with garlic, roasted garlic, mushrooms, Chinese eggplant, you can see I have an Asian bent because I'm really hungry for Asian food here in Albuquerque. Uh, garlic naan and, you know, gar pasta with garlic sauce. I mean, there's everybody eats garlic on some level, Italian food and, and, and otherwise. But it is commonly, commonly easy to use, easy to store. Um, and uh, it's something that I highly recommend. And it complements and pairs with the following. It pairs with ajuan, basil, caraway, chili, coriander, cumin, curry leaf, mint, mustard, oregano, parsley, rosemary, sun-dried tomato, and thyme. The last four kind of being more leading towards the uh, Italian food side. Uh, Complements with marinade soups, spice blends, and stir fries. So I want to talk a little bit about this because this is an interesting story. A lot of people ask me, Dr. Pai, you know, why did you get into integrative medicine? And I have a lot of answers. And you know, people who read my book, they'll hear my story. But one part that I didn't really talk about much in the book is there was an aspect of my father, uh, Dr. Vital Pai, has, he's retired. He's in his 80s, but he, he, he was a revered and wonderful, he's still wonderful, but uh, ENT, ear, nose, and throat physician. He, he treated patients for 53 years, saw over 350,000 patients in our state. Almost a third of our state has saw my dad sometime in his lifetime, and he's treated like four, four generations of patients. And I see a lot of those patients today as, you know, oh, your dad treated me when I was a kid, et cetera or he packed my nose when I got in a car accident or, or bar fight or whatever it was. So it was very interesting. But there was something that my dad, when he grew up in India, he had to have the story. He'd tell me that, oh, that every time he'd have an earache as a child, his mom would take crushed garlic, put it in coconut oil, heat it up, and then put it in the ear. And the ear infection would go away. Now, my dad told me this story, just like most people will have a parent, mother or father, who will tell them some kind of story. Right. And they're kind of repetitive in the stories like you hear it when you're a child and like every year you keep hearing the same story over. So as a child, I heard this story like all the time. Anytime I complained about my ear or something about ears came up or something about ear infections, my dad would say, hey, you know, this is what I used to do. And then later on, as I got a little bit older, like in junior high. My dad would say this, you know, you should do a study to show that, you know, that there's some kind of antifungal benefits of garlic because my mom used to do this when I was a kid and, and I used to hear this over and over again. So finally, you know, when I went to, uh, when I graduated from high school, my brother was getting married at the time. Uh, he's six years older than me. And um, he was going to India. He was, in, he was in India. He met a girl and they were going to get married. And so I, at that time, I was like, hey, I have this little bit of time between uh, high school and college. I want to go to India. I haven't been there for a long time and kind of get back to my roots. I kind of took a trek from north to south, you know, spent a, a couple of weeks and looking, you know, just like at the, at the rural lifestyle, looking at Ayurvedic medicine, getting a little bit of understanding of that and yoga and meditation and all these things that were traditionally from my background, which I was not really exposed to living in the United States. And so when I was there, uh, one of the things I did see very interesting is that when I went to the clinics to visit ENT clinics, MD ENT clinics, not just Ayurvedic doctors, but MD trained, conventionally trained doctors, when, when children had ear infections, they would actually get garlic, crush it, put a little coconut oil, put it in, warm it up, put it in the ear of the patient. And I saw this and I kept on going to all these little places, villages to the hospital. They kept on using this. And I'm like, wow, this is really interesting. So my dad talked about this all the time. And I thought it was just like a, you know, kind of a folks tale that my dad was telling me. And then I realized like there's something to this. Maybe I should do a study as my dad told me to do. And so finally, when I was in, uh, in uh, college, I had a, a time off uh, during the summer, one of the summer, I said, let me just do a project. I came to University of New Mexico. I was actually at college in Occidental College in Los Angeles. And I said, let me go back to my home state to do some research. Uh, I met a, a wonderful microbiologist, really famous, named Dr. Platt, Mark Platt. And um, he was from England. And at that time, there was no Indian restaurants in, in Albuquerque. Uh, this is, again, 1994, 1995. And so uh, he said, hey, if you can make me some Indian food, 
I will uh, help you with your study. Uh, let, we can just try to do this. You can use my lab. I'll teach you how to use all the equipment, et cetera, et cetera. So I said, great deal. I'll, I'll make food and you can teach me this and then you can help you know, me publish this paper because I want to see this antifungal effect. Is it true or not? Now, he was just really hungry. He wanted Indian food. There's no Indian food at that time in Albuquerque. And for me, I needed someone to help me because I'm not a microbiologist. So I had to learn how to use, you know, the pipettes and how to do trays and how to grow cultures of bacteria and funguses and, you know, all these kind of scientific things. And so we did the swap. And what happened is at the beginning, he said, well, you know what? I'll let you use the facility. I'll help you with all these things. You know, we can trade for food, all this stuff like that as a student. I have no problem doing that. But we need some money to buy supplies, right? And I needed about $2,000 to run the study. I needed, you know, plates and, you know, dishes and, you know, just the equipment. The, the university has it, but we have to purchase it from the department. And I just can't ask the department if I'm not part of faculty, I'm a student of another school, you know, the university coming and doing research, uh, can we do that? So he said, you know, why don't you write a letter to all these companies about using their product in the study and see if they can give you some money, you know, $250, $500. So I did. So I sat there and I made a list of all the garlic supplement companies, okay? Aged garlic, powdered, liquid, you name it, all the different ones that are up on the market. And I also wrote to the drug companies. Now, why this is important and why we have a problem with, with ear infections is that most people think of ear infections as being bacterial, when in fact, half of them are actually fungal. And so, especially in other countries where there's or humid areas of the United States, for example, um, you know, overseas, they call it, you know, Hong Kong ear, hot weather ear, um, people who are swimmers or people who live in the south or places where it's super, super humid, you know, and we get wet and, and we get an ear infection, a child or adult, it's usually actually a fungal infection, not a bacterial infection. Now, the problem is that we go to an ENT or a pediatrician or your primary care and they'll, they'll look in your ears. And when a child is screaming and, you know, heart, you know, they're having fever, they're, they're agitated, they're, the ear is really hurting, it's really painful. Usually the doctors don't really, you know, about 80% of the time, I'd say, you know, offhand, they have a trouble actually looking at the eardrum. So it's red, it's angry, they can't really see it, the child's moving, parents trying to hold the child. So they just write a prescription and say, okay, here's an antimicrobial drops for the ear. The challenge is that when they put that drops in the ear, if the eardrum is perforated, meaning there's a little tear or a hole in the eardrum because of the infection has been so powerful, it usually ruptures the eardrum, which is common, that these antimicrobial drops, these prescription antimicrobial drops, which cost roughly about 60 to $90 for a little bit of a bottle, like an eyedropper bottle. So super, super expensive. Okay. And this is in 1995. So things haven't gotten really much cheaper. But if they put it in the ear, if the eardrum is perforated, then that is autotoxic to the inner ear, meaning it gets into the inner ear and actually causes damage into the inner ear, which then causes hearing problems. So a lot of these children that have been treated in all countries, the United States included, all countries that have these little fungal infections of the ear, we don't get a good view to see whether there's a uh, tear in the, uh, the, um, the tympanic membrane, the eardrum. So they just prescribe the drops, they give the drops, it kills the infection, but a little bit gets into the ear and then that child has hearing problems and then the child develops speech problems because they can't hear. So it's a very, very common issue when we see children that have speech and language development problems that actually, if you go back in their history, they would have had early ear infection and most likely the eardrum was perforated when they were treated. So why is it important? Because right now when they were looking at it overseas, garlic doesn't have this autotoxicity into the inner ear. So going back, I wrote this letter I wrote letters to every garlic company and every drug company. Say, hey, um, you know, this is my name. This is the university. This is who I'm working with. I want to show the benefits having this anti. Does garlic have antifungal effects against the common, what's called aspergillus? This is the common mold, the uh, fungus that grows in ears when it's moist and you know stuff like that. And to my surprise, everybody rejected it. Now I understood the drug companies because drug companies never want to show anything that's better better than theirs. So I understand, you know, the, you know, the ketoconazole companies and Nazarol companies, all the companies are making anti-prescriptions and the eardrop companies are like, no, 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 no. All the German pharmaceuticals are like, no, no, no. But the natural products is I'm like, hey, I'm going to be using your product. And if it works great, then you know, even better for you. Like something to you, can, you can promote your product as here's a, here's an evidence base. They all said no. And it's very interesting because the, not only the drug companies, the drug companies specifically said there's no antimicrobial, no antifungal properties of garlic. So 
I don't know why you're talking about even studying that. And then even the natural therapies from the garlic companies themselves who were selling products for heart health, for heart aging and for blood pressure and cholesterol, all these ones, these are garlic companies that are touting everything, you know, from the sun down that garlic does. It didn't, they didn't say that has anything to do with antimicrobial. So they said, no, we don't think it, garlic has those effects. Okay. So interesting thing across the, across the way of the, our lab, there was actually another research group from China. And the Chinese doctor there was actually studying in a, a concentrated garlic oil for making it into a topical uh, application for fungal infections in HIV patients. For those people who don't know, when people who are immunocompromised with like, say, for example, and again, this is 1995 before we had all these wonderful drugs now that, you know, people only really remember those days, but, you know, but when people had HIV, they would get these really bad fungal infections of their skin because their skin was, their body was so immunocompromised. And then they have to treat them with these really strong antifungals and it interfered with their antiviral medications, et cetera. And we didn't have them as much at the time. So it was a problem. And they were showing that they, they would do a certain process of this concentrated garlic oil, put it on the topical fungal agents, and it would just basically... Uh, eliminate the, the infection. So I got to know them across the way and said, hey, can we understand some of your protocol? And we started to look at which extract works. And we got the garlic fresh, like my mom, my, 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 my father's mom, right? My grandmother uh, would crush it. And then we would, you know, process it. And, and then we did like just a, uh, an aqueous garlic extract, just I mean, like crushing it and putting it in, you know, directly. And then a concentrated garlic oil, which is a specific way of processing it. And we even did time degradation studies, meaning like starting from the minute that we cut it, you know, processing it and plating it, putting it on the little desk with the little fungus growth on the plates and comparing it to the, you know, which would be the comparison would be to the drug standard, which is the, the eardrops, right? And you want to see which one has a bigger zone of inhibition, meaning once you put a little bit on these little bit of these little plates, you know, which one would have the greatest zone that it's not growing, right? And, you know, you put the prescription drug on the plate, you know, put on these little seed in these little plates, and you'll see there's a certain zone, like a one centimeter, two centimeters around the garlic, uh, around the uh, uh, medication that the fungus on the plate won't grow, right? So it's a zone of inhibition, meaning it doesn't grow. It has that effect of blocking the growth. So, you know, you'd put the, the garlic and you'd see, like, is there any kind of size? And to, uh, well, not a surprise, that's the whole aspect of what we were studying for, is it actually did have antifungal effects. But not only had antifungal effects, it was actually greater than the pharmaceutical drugs. Now, interesting thing is when we cut the fresh, this is the most important thing to understand about activity of antimicrobial properties with garlic, is that it only works with the fresh. So all the aged garlic extracts, all the things that are kind of commonly given uh, that people take, like, oh, I buy this at the store, I buy this concentration, uh, does not have that approach because when it's aged, you're losing what they call the allicin. Allicinase, allicin is one of the main components. When you cut garlic, you know, it has a little bit of a pungentness, you know, kind of like onions, you kind of can cry or it's really kind of a strong uh, sulfury smell. Well, that, that activity is active just when you cut it and it degrades over time, even 15, 20 minutes, it starts to decrease, decrease, decrease. So when we had this concentrated garlic oil, there was a specific way of actually how we could actually process it. So we were kind of standardizing and maintaining that potency at that freshness, you know, and there's ways that we had to freeze it and flash freeze it, et cetera, so that we're keeping the temperature. So it has that activity. And we showed that all the garlic supplements didn't work. All the aged garlic supplements didn't work. And most importantly, most importantly, that the concentrated garlic oil and the aged, and just the aqueous garlic extract, but the concentrated garlic oil had an actually even higher benefit than the uh, drugs, the eardrops, and is not autotoxic, meaning it does not cause any inner eardrum uh, toxicity. Now, even quite interesting, which was different in my study, which I know now, which I didn't know then, is that we actually also tested it along with the coconut oil, right? Because that was a delivery system that's given in India all the time. Ayurvedic medicine used to get, you know, they, in the clinics, both again, conventional and traditional. Um, but when we did it in our lab, the, the garlic, the, the garlic worked, but the coconut at that time did not show to have antimicrobial benefits. Now, so we published like, okay, the, it's the garlic, it's not the coconut. Coconut oil is a carrier. Now, a lot of people who are listening to this will say, no, but I've heard that coconut oil has all these antimicrobial properties. And it does. 
The reason why our studies came out differently is because at that time in 1994, 1995, is that the way that what we got exposed to, meaning in terms of the processing of coconut oil on the market, like if we just go to a store, I'll just buy some coconut oil. Now we didn't have organic, we didn't have raw, we didn't have any of these things that we do now commonly go to any store now and get these things. But that time, so when it wasn't, they actually, the more processed the coconut oil, and the less organic and the less raw it is, it actually loses its antimicrobial properties. So obviously what we were using in the study was not what they would be using naturally in the country of India at the time, right? So they're using like fresh, real, and we're buying something that was you know, manufactured. And at that time, they used to even um, hydrogenate, believe it or not, they used to actually add more bonds to make the, the, the coconut oil even more saturated than they used to. So there's a little bit of issue. I should probably go back and show the benefits. But now we know that the coconut also has some of the antimicrobial properties added to the antifungal activities. Now, why this is why it's so important? Why is the game changer for me? It's because at that time, um, after we did the study, now and it was positive and it's fantastically positive, by the way. We're like, okay, what do I do with this? I said, I want to publish. And at that time, I was really naive. I mean, I was medical, you know, I was in college, I was looking at going to medical school at the time, and I was like, okay, I want to publish this in the top medical journal. Like this is science at its best, right? We're taking something natural, and we want to prove it like the scientific method that we're supposed to be using uh, in Western medicine. And so I picked, believe it or not, my naivete, I picked the New England Journal of Medicine to submit it to, right? It's like the number one most conservative journal side of JAMA, the Journal of American Medical Association. New England Journal was like the journal. And so I sent it in, I, you know, everything was written beautifully and all the stuff like that. And at that time, there was an editor-in-chief, and his name was Dr. Arnold Rahman. And he was very, very much at that time uh, anti-natural medicine, anti-alternative medicine, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and this is again 1995, early in the day. And um, you know, I sent out you know the letter, and I, I got the scathing letter back, and it was really harmful and hurtful for me. It was basically saying that there was no place in uh, in uh, in medicine for natural ingredients, and it was really scathing and negative. And I, I was kind of crushed because I was I was expecting like, here, I follow the scientific method like this should be like newsworthy. And I was really taken back. It was kind of, again, naivety when you're really young, you don't realize, you know, with the whole politics of medicine and pharmaceuticals and academia and, you know, natural versus prescription, et cetera. So it was it was quite it was quite it was quite a, a harmful thing in, in my to my ego. I was kind of crushed. And then I was like, I didn't know where to publish it because I was like, that was my goal. Like I wanted to publish it in the top journal. Um, and so uh, doc, the, the microbiologist, Dr. Platt, helped me publish it in the top microbiology journal, Letters of Applied Microbiology, at that time it got published. But the interesting thing what I want to show here is that um, once the publication came out in the journal, which was in microbiology, I got editorial review from two of the top journals in the world, The Lancet and British Medical Journal. Right. Those are the, 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 the European and the, and the, and, and the, and the uh, British equivalent of the NM, uh, uh, New England Journal of Medicine over there. And their editorial wrote that it was wonderful. It was a great study. And not only that, that this is something that could help millions of people around the world who cannot afford the expensive medications that we give here in the Western world, and also to avoid the toxic side effects like inner ear damage that will cause hearing problems. It was a safer and effective treatment option provided in the study. So it was a very interesting, like from a non-biased, you know, openness of just looking at science, I was commended and, and congratulated. And yet here on my state side, it was kind of like, you know, we don't want to, we don't believe in natural medicines. And so this was a really big turning point in my life because I really understood like when we use science and that's why when people see me, they go, Hey, when I see a cancer patient or I'm helping a patient and we're looking at evidence space, everything that we use is evidence space. We want to look at things that have scientific data, whether it's being published in, you know, Europe or in a different language, as long as it's peer reviewed and is, you know, we have to make sure that there's no kind of, you know, undue influence, which a lot of studies have these days, right. In pharmaceuticals, particularly, and even in some of the supplements as well, but we want to look at like, we have to be following science and that's when we follow science, then that is quite great because a lot of things that we've been providing in Ayurvedic medicine for thousands of years, 3000 years ago, 
Charak was talking about the benefits of garlic for heart health, right? So now we're just coming back full circle. Nothing is, is reinvented. Everything is just kind of, uh, you know, just nothing is new. Everything is just brought back and, you know, retranslated into uh, a, a language that we all understand. So this is something I just wanted to share everybody because everybody asked me like, well, you know, you're always like evidence based and really hardcore in the science because we have natural things. So if a patient comes to me with cancer and then they say they have like, you know, say they have you know, uh, breast cancer, you know, estrogen positive, or maybe triple negative, or maybe colon cancer, or prostate cancer, lung cancer, brain tumors. It's like there's in vitro and in vivo data that we can pull up that will show natural agents effectiveness in that cancer cell metabolism. And more importantly, then what we do is our specialties looking at then what was that product that was used in the study? Can we get that product at that clinical dose and just replicate it like it was done in the studies? And that's why we have our success. But what I want to explain is that it's always potency, purity, safety, and efficacy. People have to understand, I just can't go buy just regular garlic or I can't just go buy regular turmeric. There's specific potencies and purities of these things that will give people the um, wanted and intended effect. But without it, then they won't get that effect. And sometimes that's when the Western medicine says, we'll see, that's why you need to take this drug. So the greatest thing is now for anybody that does have any kind of fungal infection of their children in the ear, again, I'm not dispensing medical advice here, but this is something that's safe and effective. You can get some fresh organic garlic, crush it up really well with a little mortar and pesto if you want to, or even you can put in a little bit of a blender with a little bit of water. You can get organic raw coconut oil, put a little bit, you're not putting a lot, you're just putting a couple of drops in there, a couple of little drops of, of coconut oil, heat it very, very, very little to like a lukewarm temperature. That's the, the heating is also soothing for the inner ear canal. And you can apply a few drops for those fun kind of fungal infections. So when people have swimmer's ear, swimmers here in the United States, that is a fungal infection. So those people, most people who are swimmers or people who are in, again, humid areas are well, well knowing to have this uh, in their childhood. This is something that's safe and effective that you can use as a remedy. And this is one of the many reasons, again, along with the stories that were in my book, uh, An Inflammation Nation, that had turned me to go and to say, hey, I want to go into integrative medicine where we're looking at the best of everything. We're using scientific knowledge and evidence-based therapies, but actually proving and utilizing natural medicines that have a wisdom of centuries and thousands of years. So I want to thank you all for listening to part six of the series of healing spices, fennel seed, fenugreek, galangal, and garlic. Again, if you want to contact me, uh, you can contact us at sangevini.net. We see patients all over. We do health coaching and consultations, both in person and online. We have wonderful products that are, are patented, clinically tested at sangevinistore.com. And for those who are just new to the series and new to listening to me, you can listen to an Inflammation Nation. That's a book that's available on Amazon or on our website for a signed copy or on Audible. And then for those who are interested in our natural anti-inflammatory, Bosmeric, go ahead and take a look at that. That has the patented forms of curcumin, Boswellia, ginger, and black pepper, and a bilayer sustain release caplet, 20 minute onset of action, eight hour, cent, uh, eight hour sustain release. So, thank you very much for listening and taking the time to spend with me today. Hopefully, the story was interesting. I want you to eat a little bit more fennel uh, this week. Definitely try some more fenugreeks in your lifestyle. When you go to a Thai restaurant, look in the soup, you'll notice it's probably not going to be ginger, it's going to be gongal, or ask the staff and say, Is this gongal? I'll say yes, and they'll be probably pretty much impressed that you knew that it wasn't ginger. And obviously, everybody can eat a little bit more garlic for all the wonderful benefits. And then when you do, you might remember the story about me publishing the study. And this is what's changed ever since then. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies since that time. Now, everybody talks about now, even every garlic company will always cite the study saying, oh, it has antimicrobial properties. But remember, it's the fresh, not the aged or the you know, the powdered forms. Uh, we do sell, we do offer garlic in its uh, uh, powdered form that does have the allicin component uh, that ha now has been able to be extracted and, and standardized and patented so that we can use garlic now as an antimicrobial. We use it for other types of infections. That is very, very helpful. Uh, but just letting you know, fresh garlic is great, or you have to use the pills that are the right kind. And you can look at our website to find that, sandgeminystore.com. Or if you're looking for heart health, just eating the garlic, regularly cooking it, you know, baking it, or even using a, an aged garlic supplement if you like. But since garlic is so readily available, I recommend people just eating it as a food as much as possible. And then if you need it as uh, for an infectious agent, you can also still chop and eat them, you know, chew one or two cloves when you have a cold or flu, fantastic. Um, and those are ways that you can use food as medicine.
So I want to thank you again for listening to me today. And hopefully we'll see you again on part seven. Part seven, we're going to cover ginger. We're going to cover horseradish. We're going to cover juniper berry and kokum. Now, probably haven't heard of the last two of those. So stay tuned. There are some wonderful, interesting things that will help with diuretic effect, uh, weight loss effect, and some more anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory benefits. Nice. Thank you. I want to hear about your dad. Oh, uh, so what about my dad? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, is he vegan? So he's plant-based. Yeah, my, my, both my parents are plant-based. Fantastic. It's funny, you know, as an ENT, he's very, you know, ENTs are very conservative, right? Like my dad's like super specialist. He's like triple fellowship. So he would do super otology surgeries, like inner ear, cochlear implants, you know, those kind of high end, you know, head and neck cancers and stuff like that. Train at Mass and Eye Ear, you know, in Boston and Harvard, you know, Penn and Tufts and Brown, triple fellowship kind of thing. Um, So he went, you know, once I went plant-based in in 2006, uh, eventually, you know, I had him watch, you know, the Forks Over Knives and gave him the China study and all. And then he would recommend plant-based diets. And he used to, like me, like I I, I sold 800 uh, books of the China study in like two years when it first came, you know, into our practice. My dad was doing roughly about half that or more in an ENT office, believe it or not. And people would come in with dizziness and with all sorts of chronic, you know, vertigo problems, dizziness problems, inner ear problems, sinus congestion all and he would just say you got to go plant-based it's all anti-inflammatory and just give him the book or he'd give him you know later on he'd give him my book and inflammation nation and the the patients would get better i mean patients that he'd be seeing for like 20 30 40 years 50 years eventually um it's because it's all about changing the lifestyle getting your immune system stronger getting the inflammation down getting your microbiome stronger getting a higher nutrient density in your diet so it's very interesting now that you know a super specialist was even talking about plant-based medicine uh for his patients Nice. You know, when you talk about something like garlic, is there still benefit whether you eat it in the powdered form or the whole form or is one form better than the other? Well, the, well, uh, so the powder is still okay. The challenge with powders, particularly again, when we talk about just general spices is that most people will go to the big box store and they'll buy a thing of garlic powder, you know, big like pound, two pound bottle of it. And they, uh, those things degrade over time, just like all spices. So always, if you're buying garlic powder, buy the smallest size of of garlic powder because you do want to use it uh, soon. It still has the health benefits, but the data will be cooking more with fresh. Now it doesn't have to be like what I was talking about. You got to chomp it and, you know, eat the whole thing fresh, that, that pungent, but cooking more with it. And that's why when you look at Asian cooking in general, Italian cooking, it's like, they're always putting, you know, garlic and onion and all the spices, like an almost every type of dish on some level, some more than others, but we kind of cut it. We kind of roast it. We kind of grill it. We kind of saute it. We, 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 we cook with it. Sometimes it's sprinkled on things, but that's just the added benefit of adding it to your daily diet. Great. Thank you. Do you like black garlic? I do. It's kind of interesting. It's got a, a different type of taste to it. Uh, it is a little bit more expensive. So there's a little bit of issue with, with that, with some of our, you know, with patients. And usually I just have people first just like say like, Hey, just start with the garlic itself. I used to like, you know, from an Italian perspective is like, you know, getting the elephant garlic and baking it, you know, and then when you, you know, you bake the elephant garlic, you know, those are the big ones, you know, then uh, like uh, Italian restaurants do that really, really fancy ones too. Or if you're, then you can, you can open, you just open it up. It's like a, it becomes super soft and then you can spoon it out as butter. Right. So instead of making garlic butter, which you don't want, I don't want, we don't want the animal protein. We don't want the estrogens. We don't want, we don't want the saturated fat and all other stuff. But when you, when you can bake it, then it, you just open up the, it's like super soft. It's like you open it up and it's just like butter. You just spoon it out and you can put it on your bread or whatever you want to do. So it's a wonderful thing that people can do. And uh, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite things to have is um, baked garlic that way. Nice. You know, when I eat garlic, that's raw, it, it just doesn't set well with me. I, I, I just have this weird metallic taste in my mouth for 24 hours, but I love it when it's cooked or roasted. Is sure. that thing? I, I don't think I'm making yeah. it. No, no. Some people, uh, you know, and there's that pungency of that, right? There's a little bit of that, that activity. And that's why, you know, most cooking, we saute it a little bit. We kind of roast it before, you know, and always putting it in the pan and cooking it down a little bit. So that's something that I don't, I don't think you're getting less benefits. Uh, you're just getting a little bit less of the antimicrobial benefits, but you don't need to have that antimicrobial benefits every meal, right? That's only if you're sick, for example. Nice. Okay. So a question was submitted for you. And this is actually about spices in general and allergies. It's from Ellen. She says, what 
Um, okay. She said she did the prick test for food allergies. The results were negative, although she found out through an elimination reintroduction diet and a series of throat biopsies that she was very allergic to chicken, fish, seafood, milk, gluten, and eggs, which made her depressed and gave her uh, migraines. She says, in light of the false negative, any idea how to test spice allergies that she suspects? She's whole food plant-based, so spices are more important to her than ever. Sure. Yes. So, so we do that by blood testing. Uh, so she can contact our office and we'd be glad to set her up with that. So a couple of things. Skin prick test is notoriously, you can get false negatives and also false positives because you're testing the skin. You're pricking the skin against the antigen or what you're allergic to, and it's supposed to send out a response of inflammation. The problem is right now is that everything that we take in our diet, if you're healthier, right, or you take medications uh, can dampen that response. So taking an anti-inflammatory, whether it's a turmeric or bosmeric, or even uh, taking a thyroid medication, blood pressure, uh, um, antidepressants, anti-anxiety pills. I mean, there's a lot of medications that will actually dampen this effect. And just eating more anti-inflammatory foods will lower this skin prick effect. So a lot of people, they, they will say, gosh, I eat this, I have some kind of symptom or problems, but I do the skin prick as negative. When we do the blood testing, we're looking at two reactions. We're looking for immediate reactions that happen within an hour. And then the, the delayed reaction actions that happen a few hours up to four days later. Now on our panel, we do have a plant-based panel. We have standard American diet panel. So she do this, uh, the plant-based panel. However, we would then also add spice. We do have, there's actually a spice uh, list and people can add that. We do have a, a set of common spices that are in our panel, but that actually would send her to the website of a lab company. And then she can then add on specific spices or even herbs that now that we gravitate eating more plant-based, depending on where we live and depending on the diet that we eat, we might be more heavy with certain herbs and spices. So definitely you can still have a problem with any food. And that's why we like to test because as people go plant-based or they're highly concentrating now certain spices or foods or herbs, we definitely want to make sure that they don't have sensitivity to that as well. Right. Great question, people, by the way. People are asking where you're located, but it almost doesn't matter because you do virtual, right? Everything is virtual. Yeah, you can come to Albuquerque if you want to come here. Bugs Bunny Kim took left. You know, that's where, that's where we're at, breaking down. So we're, 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 we're great. You know, we love to see people in person. We have a wonderful full, 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 full service center here. We have we do cooking classes. We do yoga. We have float tank. We have our wonderful dog. Marines, the Ayurvedic doctor in our clinic. We do massage, poncha, karma, which is detoxification, Ayurvedic treatments. It's a wonderful thing. We have our store and everything like that. Uh, uh, but um, we even have like central, uh, we have a, you know, cloud mats. We have all sorts of technologies and wonderful things, but we do most, most of our patients are virtual. So we, we see them virtually. Uh, we send them all the testing kits and all the lab work. We don't make any money on labs. We don't upcharge on any of the labs. Most of the things, if we can get through insurance, like, like the primary care screening, like thyroid or, you know, vitamin D or cholesterol, blood sugar, all stuff, you know, lab core uh, or, or quest is what we would probably use for them. Uh, that, they can get that through insurance. And then all the functional labs, all the integrative lab tests, you you know, we, it's just between them and the lab and they usually get the cash price, which is the cheapest or depending on their plan, sometimes they're covered or they're, most of it's covered. So that's, that's, that's how we work. Thank you. I, Albuquerque is one of those words that's really hard to spell. Yeah, it's uh, very hard to spell. Uh, yeah, there's two questions in the chat. One from Justina. Is there a difference eating the spices versus eating the whole plant? So like, I don't really use fennel seed, but I love to eat fennel, for example. So, um, Yes, because depending on the, the concentration of the ingredients that we're looking for, and in some of those, the roots, the, the bark, the leaf, the, the berry, the flower, it all has different aspects of health. So you can eat the whole plant, obviously, uh, but spices are sometimes the concentrations of those plants or will have sometimes completely different uh, sometimes they're similar and more concentrated, and sometimes they're actually completely different. In the book, Healing Spices, so if she wants to know more about that, it actually will go through a little bit more of that. I'll talk about the part of the plant because there are certain parts, right? Like we, you know, this, this, I eat the seeds, or I only eat the stalk, or I eat the, this, the roots, or this, the flowers, or this, the berries, right? Um, they do have aspects, and I'll talk about, like, so for example, like even with the, with the Galangal gal I was talking about, there's three different types of that. And there's one that's used more for medicinal use. And there's one that's used more for um, cooking. Oh, nice. Yeah. And Mona would like to know, where did that question go? Uh, does freezing garlic, and I don't know what this means, tuner mix and ginger root affect their nutritional value? Um, no, it doesn't. It actually will help preserve it, but you only can keep it in the freezer for so long. You know, so I don't like to keep things more than several weeks. Otherwise it loses its potency. And then when you take it out, you pretty much want to use it 
you know, relatively sooner. Now, depending on what kind of activity you're looking for for that. So it will still have the anti-inflammatory cardiovascular benefits, regardless of how long when you take it out, it's still going to have that effect and, and flavor the food and whatnot. But when you're looking at that antimicrobial aspect of it, that's only going to be very quick. So you want to, you, you know, I still kind of save that for like, if I'm sick or ill, then that's the fresher, the more antimicrobial properties is. But for everything else, yeah, you can go ahead and, and um, do that. That's great. Well, thank you. This was a lot of fun. Thank Maybe, you. Yeah. Bring your dad on with you next time. He sounds like he'd be great. Yeah. So I'll, 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 I'll send my dad your wishes and, and tell everybody, Hey, your dad, I spoke about you today about the study that you told me to do in 1995, but it was a great, it was a great thing to do because like my dad was super you know, vindicated uh, in one level. Cause you know, I used to always think like, Oh God, he's going to tell me the story again and again and again, but that was true. Like there's a reason why historically we do things. And if it didn't work, they wouldn't be still doing it today. Right. So all we have to do is just now kind of prove it so that Western wise from our language or our science, we can say, OK, there's a reason for that. Nice. Has anybody from watching the show contacted you as a patient? Oh, I got tons of patients from from this. Oh, my God. Fantastic. I'm yeah. glad. You yeah, I appreciate it because, you know, everybody who's coming in who's already, you know, if you're already thinking about going plant based or you need to move a little bit more plant based or even that's the best type of patient I like to have, because then we're not sitting there trying to explain you know, what a vegetable is or why we need phytonutrients or fiber. Now we still kind of guide them like what their sensitivities, what their microbiome, what their deficiencies or toxicities might be, et cetera, et cetera, how to help lower their medications or get off medications, which is our goal with natural therapies and actually diet and lifestyle at the very end of the day and changing epigenetics. That's the goal. But uh, yeah, I appreciate all the other people who listen to the show because, you know, just having that motivation to take this lifestyle change to say, Hey, you know, putting in good food is, you know, put it runs. Them. I tell people either run like a Ferrari or a Ford. If you want to be a Ferrari, you got to put better fuel in the body. So not that there's anything wrong with Fords, but you know, it's just like, that's everybody thinks they're a sports car and they're not kind of, kind of thing. So the idea is that we teach people, but it's not an it's easy thing to do. It's a lifestyle change. So we start off with the things that are the largest triggers of inflammation that are sensitivities and then guide that patient. Some people can change overnight. Some people can take several months. Some, I have some patients who've taken, you know, up to 10 years and then now they're coming in and they're off all their meds. They've lost, I had one guy come in the other day. He's lost 150 pounds. Now it's been 10 years. Right. But so some people can do that with three months and some people, but to me, it's like, as long as they're moving in the right direction, that's the goal. And we're talking about risk reduction, not perfection. That's our goal. So moving them slowly is key. Fantastic. I can't believe there's people you have to actually explain what a vegetable is. Oh, there's a lot. I mean, the half, remember half the people have watched your show and half the people may not might have any clue because there's still misinformation about ketogenic diets, paleo diets, you know, and high animal protein, you know, collagen protein, blah, blah, blah. That's all been proven, you know, to be wrong and inappropriate for your health, but there's still industries and people who push that. And so, you know, sometimes we have to kind of bring them back to, to reality, back to the science, back to the facts, but then also lead them and hold them their hand and just kind of give them guidance because it is kind of like, well, I'm not used to this. A lot of people may have not have been eating this way for decades. So, uh, you know, and, and we start where people are at. Sometimes people don't have access to, you know, fresh produce. You know, how do you use packaged plant-based foods? We can even start with there. Like any transition moving to a healthier diet is only going to be a positive benefit. Great. Thank you, Dr. Pai. All right. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Yep. See you on part seven. Part seven. And thanks all of you for watching right. another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back at 2 p.m. We have a bonus show today. Kathy Carmichael is going to be demonstrating my very favorite potato salad in the whole world. Take care.